So Alex O'Connor has already debated Ben Shapiro in the past. And uh, now he is debating Michael Knowles on whether or not America is a Christian nation. So this ought to be good. I, of course, already know the answer. Of course it's not. Even if the founders of America were Christian, even if they took inspiration from Christianity, America was designed to be a secular nation. No religion is to be prioritized over another uh, or interfere with governing and whatnot. A political tone, that is, this description of Christian nationalism as a, as a sort of right-wing danger to the fabric of America in the way that a lot of right-wingers will see you know, left-wing radical wokists as a danger to the fabric of America. And so the focus is, I suppose, maybe more on the, the nationalism part than the Christian part. But there's also just this historical question, which is the one that I'm more interested in, which is uh, less about, let's say, the, the danger of people who today believe in the existence of God and the, and the risks that they might pose to American democracy, whatever that might mean. But whether the country that you're in is uh, best described in a historical sense as a Christian nation. And I've heard you say before, that it is. And I've heard you use phrases like the soul of America is Christian and saying things like this. And I suppose the first thing I wanted to clarify is, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but if you do say that America is a Christian nation or perhaps ought to be a Christian nation, are you talking here legally, like uh, in terms of the documents, the constitution, or are you just talking about the, say the culture or, or something like that, or the philosophy undergirding the, the, the legal element of this conversation? I don't always neatly separate these two things. I know that some American libertarians are fond of saying that, you know, politics is totally distinct from culture or something like that. I, I think that's all a little bit silly. I think what we're talking about here when we talk about the soul of the country is uh, a nation's constitution, capital C, and a nation's constitution, lowercase c, and that laws and customs and taboos and ends and goals are, are not so neatly separable. So uh, another problem, I suppose, with Americans being a little dismissive of history is that uh, we pick arbitrary dates to start looking at our own history. So t typically, uh, Americans look at 1776, or else, you know, a, a little over a decade later at the Constitutional Convention, and they will say, this is the beginning of America. But it does cause one to ask, well, hold on, where did those people come from? How did they get there? And uh, so um, America right. begins a little earlier than that. I would trace it to 1620 to the Mayflower. One could, I suppose, trace it in different parts even earlier than that. But in any case, wherever you trace it to, uh, the men who came there broadly were Christian. They certainly came from a Christian culture. And where... So he's instantly doing the thing. I don't care if they were all Christian. Their version of Christian was different. This is the same thing that they try to say where they're like, well, the people that founded America were white, you know. They weren't really. They were Anglo-Saxon. The type of Christian that they're talking about is going to be a different type of Christianity than what we probably uh, follow today or what Knowles would follow today, what is common today. Like, the majority of people at first in America were also men. <laughs> America is not founded to be a man nation, although it's kind of treated like that sometimes. Where Americans have long found their origin is in the Mayflower, who, among men who were extraordinarily zealous uh, separatist Christians. Uh, in fact, you know, I'm, I'm not a, uh, an academic historian or even a trained apologist or theologian. I am a cigar salesman, and I've named my uh, cigar company Mayflower after those very men. Some of my ancestors were on that boat, and uh, they, they made it quite clear that they, that they were in the United States uh, on a religious project, uh, the country that would become the United States, on a religious project. And then the Puritans who followed the pilgrims were, uh, had slight distinctions from them theologically, but were broadly the same. And so Governor John Winthrop of uh, the Massachusetts... Yeah, but they, why did they really go there, right? They wanted to establish their own church, sure, but they also wanted freedom from the government having the regulations regarding the church. Like, all along, there, it may have even been a religious quest or some crap, but it, it was only religious because they wanted their own religious freedom. It's Bay Colony. He declared that America would be a shining city on a hill in a, in a famous speech called A Model of Christian Charity. And uh, all the way up through the revolution, Americans considered themselves to be uh, Christian. The founding fathers were a little bit of a hodgepodge of Freemasons and Deists, but there were a number of vaguely faithful seeming Christians among them. And even the ones who were not particularly uh, orthodox in their Christianity, at, at least recognize the importance of Christianity to the country. So you have a founding father, author of the Federalist Papers, and the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Courts, John Jay. He said that uh, Christianity must be the religion of the United States. He, he uh, thanked God that uh, the country had the same religion, were descended from the same stock. He, he went so far as to say that Christians, non-Christians should never hold public office. Now, there's no religious test for office in the Constitution, but there are religious parameters around the country. So if you go back to the philosophical founding document, the Declaration, wow, it, it begins and predicates the nation on the notion that uh, all men are created equal and endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. So I'm not trying to convince... Just if this guy said it, though, like, so what? That's, that's not in the Constitution. 
That's not in the Declaration of Independence. Even if it said, like, rights endowed by our creator, that's very vague terminology regarding religious stuff. That could just be any religion, even, that believes in, like, a creator, in a god that creates people or something. That, that could be any religion. Since you hear that this is a papal bull or this is, you know, uh, some particularly sectarian version of Christianity, but at the very least, the nation, I think we all would have to agree, is predicated on the notion that God exists and created us and gave us rights. And uh, then in practice, uh, uh, you know, America developed far more clearly uh, in, in a Christian manner, so much so that in our national anthem, in the little, uh, little heard final verse, the final stanza, uh, Francis Scott Key writes, uh, conquer we must when our cause it is just and this be our motto and God is our trust and it's inscribed on our money and it's in our, our pledge of allegiance. So, uh, you know, I, I think one can quibble over quite how orthodox or rigorous the Christianity of America was, but it's simply an historical fact that it was Christian men who were motivated by Christian ideas, who created Christian institutions, who founded the country, whether it was consciously Christian or not. And quibble we shall. We'll get back to Michael Knowles in just a moment, but first, I've got an exciting announcement. No. I want to invite you, this is because he writes Common Sense, which is during a time when many people in the, in the colonies were really just looking for better representation. The idea of actual revolution and independence was not as uh, inevitable as a lot of people may think. Thomas Paine writes common sense and convinces a lot of people that actually maybe independence is the goal here. And I think to this day, common sense is still the greatest selling American pamphlet now. And it's still in print, of course. He's not just the author of the American Revolution, though, of course. He's also the author of a text known as, uh, known as The Age of Reason, which espouses, sure, a philosophical deism. He says in no uncertain terms right at the beginning that he believes in one God, but also describes organized religions, including Christianity, as, uh, as essentially conspiracies to conduct power and to hold monopolies over people. And in fact, this, this leads him into, into a great deal of controversy. He ends up uh, narrowly uh, escaping execution. He gets exiled. He dies. And then when his bones are dug up to be brought back over to, to, to England, they end up getting lost. And we still don't know where his bones are today. And about six people attended his funeral. Uh, and yet this man is the author of the American Revolution. Now, why is it that at the end of his life, he's treated with such disregard and contempt? It might have something to do with the fact that his own personal uh, religious beliefs were in no uncertain terms, not Christian. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that America is a legally secular nation. It doesn't mean that uh, Thomas Paine is not an anomaly among the founding fathers. But in the way that we can say, OK, the founding document of America may be the Declaration of Independence, not a legal document. I mean, the, the Declaration of Independence is not supposed to be legislation. It doesn't protect any rights. It doesn't establish any courts. It doesn't do anything other than act as a polemic, essentially, against uh, not just monarchy, but the specific king. Well, it, so it, 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 just on that point, I mean, I, I'm sure. quite interested in many of the things you've said, and I'm not surprised that a British atheist would choose a Brit, <laughs> a very liberal Brit, <laughs> to, Thomas uh, as his favorite founding father. But, um, you know, there, there was some legal force to the Declaration, which is that the Declaration told King George that uh, they were separating. So I, I agree sure. with you. It's a different sort of document than the Constitution. Though Abraham Lincoln later then in the 19th century uh, elevates, again, the Declaration of Independence at, to the level of, I think, a more significant uh, founding document. But it, it does have some legal um, bearing in as much as it uh, kicked the whole thing off. Yeah, it's treasonous. I mean, uh, there's a, there's, there's a, I mean, there's a, I mean, literally treasonous yep. in, in the sense that if I write a document right now that uh, says something illegal, which uh, can happen in the United Kingdom, uh, this would uh, have sort of legal relevance, let's say. But the, the declaration is clearly supposed to be uh, a mixture of, of, it's supposed to draw upon law and history and also rhetoric. It's supposed to uplift and inspire a nation to revolution, which is sort of. I feel like they would benefit from defining what exactly they mean by like America being a Christian nation, even to be in the first place because it sounds like when i hear that i'm thinking okay is it like legally a christian nation but it sounds like what Knowles is talking about is culturally generally speaking the people were christian which okay but that's definitely not what i'm thinking of when i hear christian nation it might help to uh to, to define their terms what it uh, what it did and what it does but when you get to the actual legal document it takes a little bit more time and a few more people to to throw together interestingly by the way one of thomas jefferson's earliest drafts of the declaration of independence doesn't mention a creator it does say that uh, that that men and women are endowed by uh, that they are created equal but it doesn't say that they're endowed by a creator it's only sort of congress in later editing that document that that gets added in but look i'll grant it to you fine the declaration of independence has a creator but it's still not christian by the way and of course if a christian writes the creator they're probably talking about the christian creator but the whole point of america and the reason that the founders were so genius is because they recognized that not everybody living in the country and not everybody who goes on to rule the country are going to share their political opinions and so they were very clear about what kind of political views and what kind of political tests somebody must pass and which ones must not be relevant and we know that religious belief is not one of those 
uh, when, especially when we look at the Constitution and find that the only times religion is mentioned is twice. Firstly, thank you. Yes, this is kind of what I was saying a minute ago, is that even if when it says like the creator, that could mean any God that could just be that's just like vague religious, vaguely religious in saying that no religious test. Uh, that there should be no religious test to any public office in the United States. And secondly, in the later added Bill of Rights, protecting the, the free exercise of, of religion. And so I suppose what I'm asking is, when we look at the actual legal texts here, I understand the idea that referring to a creator in a Declaration of Independence, maybe, maybe Congress had the Christian God in mind. Maybe they didn't. I mean, some of these, some of these founders were, as you say, I mean, you said it was a, okay. a hodgepodge. As putting it lightly, Thomas Jefferson famously cuts out all references to the divinity of Christ from his, from his Gospels. Um, like, where are we getting this specifically Christian idea at the founding of America from, and not just some kind of vague deism that may have even uh, only been referenced in the first place in a rhetorical attempt to inspire people to, to revolution? Well, I, I totally grant that Thomas Jefferson had some problems. I'm, I'm not denying it. I mean, Thomas Jefferson was one of, if not the most liberal of the founding fathers. And then you mentioned uh, Thomas Paine, who I wouldn't count really as a founding father, but he did he did write the pamphlet that, that uh, kicked off a lot of revolutionary yeah, Wikipedia sentiment. would disagree with you there. <laughs> he, yeah, listen, you limeys, I don't know what you're doing to our founding fathers, but that man I consider separate. But he's obviously extremely important, and he was quite radical. You know, I, if we're picking our favorite Brits who were in favor of America in one way or the other, I would have to side with the great Edmund Burke, who took a, a great deal of issue with, uh, with Thomas Paine, but perhaps we can get to him a little bit later. When it comes to uh, the, the Declaration, we, we don't need to wonder too much about what, what these guys thought about the Creator, because we do have some of the writings. And uh, uh, John Adams, who you know served in the Continental Congress. Yeah, but even if they, you can conclusively prove that they were talking about God or the Christian God, that again does not mean that America was designed to be legally a Christian nation. This to me sounds like they're arguing over nothingness. And was the second president and was a political foe of uh, Thomas Jefferson, said, and the man, by the way, was not particularly orthodox in his Christianity, but he said that we all agreed that the general principles uh, for the revolution on which we could achieve national independence would be the general principles of Christianity. So he, he speaks about Christianity broadly. He's speaking uh, on behalf of his fellows in the Continental Congress and the Founding Fathers. Even as you say, if, if Jefferson didn't, he, he was a little reluctant to include the word creator. He ultimately acquiesced. And it's a document not just of single authorship by, by Jefferson, but it's a statement by this incipient country. Uh, so you see that there, but you, you see it elsewhere also. You see it in the Federalist Papers, Again, not uh, exactly reading like an encyclical or a papal bull, but the Federalist Papal Papers, specifically James Madison, uh, do cite God directly uh, by name. And uh, then you have the Constitution. You mentioned the, the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights, which uh, says that there will be the free exercise of religion. There will be no establishment of a church. This is quite misunderstood in modern day because uh, some people take this to mean that, that either there can be uh, no church established anywhere in the United States, or they would keep, go even further and say that uh, the country would be secular, you know, it'd be, it'd be absent uh, from religion. And this would have been completely uh, unheard of to the framers of the Constitution. In fact, the, the chief political reason for the refusal to establish a church at the national level is that there already were churches established at the state level. There were a number of them, and they persisted for decades after the ratification of the Constitution. So no one would have understood that to be uh, unconstitutional or contrary to the spirit of the new nation. If so, the Constitution never would have been ratified. Uh, now, later on, again, bringing Lincoln back into it, in the middle of the 19th century, you get, or later 19th century, you get the uh, 14th Amendment, which then incorporates the Bill of Rights to the states and uh, probably precludes any chance that we would have of having uh, state establishments ever again. But, you know, now we're fast forwarding over 150 years, at least at the beginning of the country. It was not understood as, as a, a having a firm separation of church and state, no matter what Thomas Jefferson might have longed for in a private letter. Yes. Well, of course, that's often referred to. And I, I know we must be careful uh, not to conflate the I say private interpretations of the founders of what the constitution said and what the constitution either actually literally says or what it should perhaps be understood to to say i mean the establishment clause doesn't just it seems to me uh preclude the ability to have an established church congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion it seems much more broad than this or prohibiting the free exercise thereof it seems to be a, a protection both of private religious belief and also or i should say both a exactly uh, protection I'm glad he brought that up that's like one of the first parts in the constitution a private religious belief, but also a preclusion of the government to legislate in any way that respects an establishment of religion, not but just again, establishing the key, some state church. The key here, though, is the, the Congress part. Congress shall make no law, because it's very easy to look back with the, the current mode of uh, jurisprudence and constitutional law and and impose that on, on the uh, Continental Congress, or I'm sorry, on the uh, a Constitutional Convention. But that, that was just not what the, the phrase meant at that time or, or for uh, 
many decades afterward. You know, uh, Congress could make no law uh, doing those things because the states could do that, and the states did that, and the states had plenty of religious laws. We, we had blasphemy laws on the books in the you're United States until very, very that, recently, though. and uh, the, the churches did have established. Wait, you're just uh, saying right. that they're like. We're, we're saying that because they already have the state churches. No, I'm pretty sure it's because the founding fathers literally came to America again to get to, to escape religious persecution. He's just this is like the most basic shit he's getting wrong. Either the states had established churches. So uh, if we're talking about um, some protection of an individual right to believe whatever he wants, that's just not there. The Constitution was far more limited. And it, it, when we're talking about something like the First Amendment, what we're actually seeing here is a restriction on the right of the Congress to sure. these sorts of declarations. So how about this then? Uh, the United States, at least at its founding, was at the federal level a secular nation. I wouldn't say secular, really. I mean, I, I would say it, uh, it did not have an established church, and I would say it did not take a sectarian side in things. The founding fathers and the framers were, were all pretty um, focused on that. But I, I just don't think it would have would have meant very much to anyone, especially considering that we're talking about a federal system here. So, you know, you, you can't... Um, you can't just view the federal government absent the state governments or absent the rights of the people for that matter. You know, one of the ironies here is, as we're debating the supposedly secular foundation of the country is the, the best description I've ever seen of the American government, uh, which came to the founding fathers uh, either directly or implicitly through other thinkers, is the description of perfect government by St. Thomas Aquinas in the Summa Theologiae, which says that there will be not merely a monarchy, uh, but there will be a monarchical element, a strong executive, and then an aristocratic element, and then a, a democratic element, representation for the people. And so in the American system, as it was founded, we've decayed a little bit since then, I'm sorry to say, uh, that's exactly what you have. You have the thumatic element in the executive, which could have been a hereditary king, or at least an elected king. Um, uh, Alexander Hamilton argued uh, to some degree for that. Um, and then we have the aristocratic element, and then obviously there's a strong democratic element. But but it, it confuses a lot of modern liberals, including Americans, because they say, you know, we're a democracy, and democracy is at stake, and, you know, whatever. Our buildings are temples of democracy. But obviously there's quite a lot to the American system that is not democratic, and it's because they were, they were trying to balance all these different types of regime, as, as well as balance different types of power, the power of the, the national government, which confusingly oh. we call the federal government, even though federal refers to all of these different layers and protections yeah. for the states, and then obviously the state power, and then the individual rights as well. Yeah. I mean, look, I, uh, I I suppose I do want to talk about Thomas Jefferson and his wall of separation, but look, I mean, suppose that we were trying on this this hypothesis that America is explicitly a secular nation and that's what the founders intended. You, you might ask, okay, could the language not have been a bit clearer? Maybe. But I could ask the same question in the other direction because really the, the, the question of whether America is a secular nation I think should best be framed as, right. is it a religious nation or not? If it's not, then what are we left with? And if the claim is that it's a Christian nation, I could ask similarly, What's with the complete and utter lack of any reference to God, let alone Christ or Christianity or anything of that sort in the Constitution? If the founders quite clearly uh, in their private letters were saying to each other, yes, this is this is certainly Christian, which also I don't even think is true. I think that for every example you have of a founder talking about the Christian basis Fuck. of America, you can find even sometimes the same founders saying the opposite. For example, famously, John Adams signs the Treaty of Tripoli which says that the government of the United States in, is not in any way founded on the Christian religion. Now, you're probably going to want to say something like, now, I don't know, again, I don't want to put words in your mouth here, but look, this is the Treaty of Tripoli, right? This is, <laughs> he's, he's quite clearly just writing to some Muslims, trying to, you know, stop them from ties. taking our sailors. Also negotiated right. by, a, uh, by a Jeffersonian diplomat. Quite right, indeed, as well. Um, and so, okay, sure. In fact, you know, why don't I avoid putting words in your mouth and, and tell me what you make of this Treaty of Tripoli, in which we have those words. I'll repeat them. I will underline them and uh, underline them again, the government of the United States is in no way founded on the Christian religion. How do you explain that one? Oh, well, I explain it exactly as you just have, which is, it's the Treaty of Tripoli, okay? And these Muslim pirates were stealing our sailors and we wanted it to come to an end. And it's not even as though John Adams negotiated this directly. In fact, tellingly, I think it was negotiated by a, uh, an acolyte of Jefferson, a Jeffersonian diplomat. And so, but all, all of that to say, I don't, I don't really dismiss your point. You're right that there was some confusion among the founding fathers and they didn't, uh, certainly didn't found the country as hierocratic or uh, theocratic or anything like that. Theocracy just being government by clerics. Uh, cer certainly it isn't. Though I, I am skeptical of your suggestion that for every um, pro-Christian uh, point that I could find in the Federalist Papers or the Declaration, or you know at least implicit in the Declaration, or in the private huh. correspondence of uh, John Adams or Madison for that matter, that you could find uh, another point on the other side. I, I agree, you can find a, a lot of confusing um, messages and even contradictions there, but I think the evidence is overwhelmingly on the side of Christianity in some form or another. So uh, yes, you're right. The, the president signs a uh, prudential treaty to, to preserve some of our sailors, and he tries to assuage the Muslims because he knows the only way to get them to stop is to say, we're not really a Christian nation, don't worry. But, you know, I, I, again, I, I think that uh, 
that that little treaty with those random little Muslim pirates taken against uh, all of the other documents and the whole you know century and a half of American history that we've cited, it doesn't it doesn't quite hold up. I think there are better arguments for and I, uh, secularism. I think that that little treaty, you know signed and directed towards that random little British king is also uh, not particularly relevant here, especially given that you just said. Are you, hold on. I do think that Knowles has a, I think that Knowles has a decent pushback here as far as like the negotiation, like they were saying it wasn't a Christian nation because of the negotiation. I think he has a decent pushback there actually. Uh, but overall, Alex is doing a great job debating this. Christianity. You said uh, you, you are telling Christ. me that the Declaration of Independence and the Treaty of Tripoli are on equal standing and significance to American history. You don't believe that. No, I don't believe that. What I do believe is that they're both equally relevant to the present conversation. Because you said a moment ago, it was quite funny how you, you said, I, I, I dispute this claim that you say that every reference I have to Christianity in the letters of, of Thomas Jefferson, in the Federalist Papers, in the Declaration of Independence, and then stops yourself and said, or, or I suppose, you know, implied yeah. by the Declaration of Independence, because you pick an example where Christianity is not mentioned at all. It, it doesn't get a mention. And, and what God I want to say is that although... Yeah, although the, the, Christ the Christianity is implicit, I agree. The Creator is mentioned. I'll give you that much. Which, well, it's, yeah, you know. it's not Ahura Mazda. You know, we're not talking about uh, some demiurge or something. I mean, I, I, presumably these men are talking about uh, some creator, at least vaguely resembling the Christian God. I'm going to, I'm going to imagine so too. Um, however, I would say, I'd refer to what I said a moment ago, which is that the, the founding fathers were uh, geniuses in this regard of knowing exactly how much of their own worldview to put into the words on the, on the page. So although they may have been thinking of a, of a, of a Christian God, it may be that they think to themselves, well, uh, let's write this in such a way that if you don't have the same view of God that I do, you can still uh, identify with this document, especially given that the Founding Fathers had completely and utterly different views of, of God, even even just amongst the company uh, that, that ended up making up the Constitutional Convention. But the, the reason that I'm, I'm drawing a comparison here to the Treaty of Tripoli is because, of course, the Declaration of Independence is, I mean, they don't have the Treaty of Tripoli, you know, in Washington, D.C., behind Congress, four inches yeah. of, of National bulletproof Archives. glass. Correct. Yeah. Um, but the point that you that the way that you say well yeah okay so john adams was was writing that america isn't christian but he was just doing this essentially as a rhetorical tool to help serve the political end that's maybe what i'm suggesting is happening in the declaration of independence it's more relevant because of course it's the declaration of independence but in the same way that mm. when i was saying a moment ago the declaration of independence is just this document that's supposed to inspire what is a predominantly christian nation to revolution he's going to say yeah endowed by their creator even though really you know that 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 maybe isn't isn't what he privately thinks, but he writes it because he's trying to achieve a political end. I think so you in just... the same way that John Adams does that with the Treaty of Tripoli. The difference is that in the Treaty of Tripoli, John Adams specifically references Christianity, and in the De Declaration of Independence, sure. uh, Jefferson does. Well, not. I, th I think you've just made my point, though, accidentally, which is uh, we have to consider who the Treaty of Tripoli is designed to persuade—a bunch of foreign Muslim pirates—and who the Declaration is designed to persuade. It's addressed to King George, but it's obviously to persuade the American colonists. So why is it that uh, the Continental Congress believed that they had to appeal to Yeah, broad... so if they're appealing to the colonists by just pretending to be religious, it suggests that some of the founders weren't really actually religious, but they were rather just appeasing political ends. ...religious, read Christian uh, principles to persuade the Americans. It's because they were broadly religious and, in fact, Christian. And they write about this, too. So if, if your argument is some of these founding fathers, you know, they might have pretended to be a bit more Christian than they actually were, I think you're probably right about that. Uh, but I think that that also kind of proves my point, because when we talk about whether or not America is a Christian nation, I'm not even uh, particularly concerned with the idle musings of Thomas Jefferson or even John Adams, who I prefer to Thomas Jefferson. I'm more concerned about that lowercase c constitution. What kind of a country is this really in practice beyond the declarations of a president or two or e even some of the elected representatives who perhaps really? have uh, different views than most people? And I think Do you this really, really want to take that approach, because isn't like participation in church declining significantly? Isn't, like, religion on a steep downward spiral in this country? Okay, Knowles, if you want to go based on society, then, on how people are acting, then America's becoming a less Christian nation by the f minute, dude. <laughs> like, if you want to do it that way, th then it's, it's looking even worse for Christianity. This is to Alexei de Tocqueville who observes that America has, a, has a, a chasm between the way that it talks and the way that it acts. You know, uh, America yes. talks in this very liberal, modern, fashionable way, but they behave in this really conservative, traditional, o openly religious way. America has always been more religious uh, than most of the West, and that's become especially true in recent years. And Tocqueville make, makes an interesting observation, too, which is that he says, America in the future will either follow secularism that exists. There's a little seed of secularism here. They will mm -hmm. either follow that toward atheism 
or they will follow the broad Christian culture toward the apotheosis of and Christianity, now we see what's which he said is, uh, Catholicism. Now, I, I know I think I've managed to upset every single person who's listening at this point. But <laughs> Alexei de Tocqueville was a very wise man, and and uh, probably he has a point here that um, the the contradictions and the the dissension uh, that you're observing in the founding era. I think you're overstating the the uh, secular impulses here. But in any case, there, there was a little bit of that. Uh, they, those ideas are going to follow themselves to a logical conclusion. So uh, again, I, I'm not even arguing that America is a Christian nation, is now and ever shall be a Christian nation. I'm merely observing that America was founded as a Christian nation going back in the early days it of was settlement. was not founded uh, to be a Christian nation, though. All right, they're just saying the same thing over and over and over again. Well, if you liked that and you want to watch me go over the rest, give this segment a like. If you want to support the channel, please consider becoming a member today. Members get early access to videos, access to all the stream VODs, and exclusive access to emotes as well. So if you'd like to support the channel, become a member today.